Just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared. Episode 58 Red Mist. War Baby here with another episode of Murderous Miners. Whenever something horrible has happened, we often wonder why there weren't signs. But as we've heard so many times, the signs are usually there but are much easier to detect in hindsight. Sometimes we even hear, They said they were going to do this, but I didn't believe them, and we shake our heads and think about how those victims were failed. In the U.S., our attention is heavily focused on gun violence, but in England, their focus for decades has been knife crime. Children as young as eight years old have been caught carrying knives, and to this day, violent knife crimes continue to plague the country. This week on Murderous Miners... It's spring break season, so we're going back to school. We head across the pond to Corpus Christi Catholic College in Leeds, England, located in the northern part of the country in the county West Yorkshire. Anne McGuire, at 61, had been teaching there for more than 40 years when she finally began to think about retiring. In April of 2014, she had it planned finish out the school year, then retire in the fall to join her husband who owned a landscaping company. The pair had met at Leeds Teaching College, where they aspired to careers in education. Both began their careers at Corpus Christi College, a secondary school in Halton Moor, Leeds, he in mathematics and sociology, she in Spanish and religion. Anne had enjoyed two excellent teachers when she was in school, one of which instilled a love of Spanish, the other the guitar. Her passion was to make sure that children had outlets for their creativity, which she embodied fully with her own kids as well. Just a few years after getting married, the young couple welcomed two daughters. Then, just a few years later, tragedy struck when Anne's sister died from cancer at the age of 35. The Maguires enveloped her two sons into their family, and the girls don't remember a time when they weren't their big brothers. All the kids dabbled in languages and musical instruments, and the Maguire girls soon went off to the boarding school for the Royal Ballet. April 28, 2014 was a school day, but Mrs. Maguire was scheduled to be off. Instead of spending the day with her husband, she diligently trudged into work to aid in a study session for their upcoming standardized tests. They had been preparing for months already and the exams were closing in at the end of the school year. Over the span of her four-decade career, Mrs. McGuire had taught several generations of families as well as many siblings. One such pupil was 15-year-old William Cornick, whose older brother had adored Anne McGuire over the course of his schooling. By 2014, she had been teaching Will Spanish since he was in the seventh grade, and now a junior, he had always been regarded as bright and conscientious, maintaining a perfect attendance record. His head teacher for year seven called him a, quote, delightful pupil who always gave his best, and one peer thought he was, quote, probably the most intelligent person I knew. So bright, in fact, that Will had already passed five of those standardized tests, the GCSEs, the previous year, when he was in year 10 instead of year 11. Academically, he did well, likely due to his aspirations of a military career with the Royal Army. But after collapsing while on vacation with his family when he was 12 years old, 
He was diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic, and his parents say this threw him into a psychological tailspin as he matured. By 8th grade and without reason, Will developed a strong dislike for his Spanish teacher, Anne McGuire, a disdain so palpable even his parents and classmates knew. In 2013, he'd found out that he was unable to join the service due to his diagnosis, a realization his mother said led to a year of self-harm. Friends began to view the once normal lad as someone who had a dark side. The Grim Reaper went up as his cover photo on Facebook, and friends started noticing, quote, disturbing aspects of his personality. Will made gruesome, disgusting comments like, quote, imagine jumping on a pregnant woman and seeing the baby come out, and made upsetting comments about cancer. He was enthralled by the fast-moving song Jungle Boogie, the theme to the film Pulp Fiction, and he was known to listen through headphones. His illogical irritation with and hatred for Mrs. McGuire grew with time, and by November of 2013, he refused to visit her classroom during the parents' open house. By Christmas Eve, Facebook messages showed that Will was irrationally obsessed with the fantasy of her death. Will told friends he would happily murder her for a payment of 10 pounds, and said, quote, The one absolute fucking bitch that deserves more than death, more than pain, torture, and more than anything that we can understand. By February of 2014, his daydreams became more vivid, and he had told friends, quote, I want power. I want the capability for choice, in a sense, to be able to get told off by McGuire and for me to turn around with skill, pride, and power and axe her fucking cockles with a long, shiny blade. He talked about killing her and spending the rest of his life behind bars and told his friends that he contemplated claiming to hear voices as a potential future defense. At school, his personal relationship with his longtime teacher was deteriorating very rapidly. She had given Will a detention and barred him from going on a school bowling trip because he hadn't turned in his Spanish homework. He defied each order, skipping the detention and going on the bowling trip anyway. Will then walked out of the meeting his parents had with Mrs. McGuire and was given in-school isolation. His mother was concerned and phoned Mrs. McGuire. Will had told his mother that he despised the teacher, and his mother told her over the phone that apparently their relationship had, quote, broken down, and that she shouldn't try to speak to him alone about their issues. Will's mother would clarify that statement, saying, quote, I meant it would be unproductive to talk with Will alone as he had made his mind up. I did not mean that he would be violent or anything of that sort. But friends said that Will had spoken about wanting Mrs. McGuire dead for years, so on April 28, 2014, when he showed up at exam prep spouting his nonsense, they just shrugged him off as usual. A friend later said, quote, We had thought he was joking because he had always gone on about wouldn't it be funny if a train came through the window and hit her, or a sniper shot her there and then? He would say, Wouldn't it be funny if she fell out of the windows and stuff like that? He said, one day I'm gonna, I'm gonna just kill her. His peers regarded him as a known liar. Even on that day, when he told 10 different students at Corpus Christi, including the head boy of his year, his diabolical plan, Will was going to stab Mrs. McGuire, stab the head of the 11th year students in the neck, and kill a pregnant teacher by stabbing her in the stomach so that he could make sure he killed her baby. Will showed four of those students a 13-inch long kitchen knife, one of two which he had brought from home. He asked one of them if they could film his upcoming attack. Not a single soul took his threat seriously. Anne McGuire arrived at Corpus Christi around 11 a.m. on her day off, intent on getting her pupils ready for the Spanish portion of their exams. Will was in her study session following the morning break with about 30 other students, some of whom split off to study in an adjacent classroom. Once seated, Will had again pulled the larger knife from his book bag, this time concealing it up one of his shirt sleeves. A bottle of Jack Daniels was in there as well to celebrate with once his deed was done. 
He winked at the kid nearest him, then rose and headed directly for their teacher's desk in the next classroom. She had only been at work for about 45 minutes when her six foot two inch student stabbed her seven times in her back and neck. Anne McGuire, a petite five foot two inch tall, was seated with her back toward the door, concentrating on the paper on her desk. She was defenseless and screamed for the students to run, saying she did not want them to watch her die. Having been stabbed so forcefully as to break ribs, she also suffered a punctured lung and a wound to the jugular vein. Everyone, including the gravely injured Mrs. McGuire, ran into the hallway screaming. The teacher collapsed into the arms of a colleague, who dragged her into the nearest office and put her foot in full weight against the door for safety. She recalled that Will, quote, just stood looking at me, no emotion. I just remember his face having no emotion, like a mask on his face. Will had just been right there with them, knife in hand. He dropped his weapon by the door as he ran back to his desk. He sat and told his classmates, good times, explaining that he'd stabbed their teacher and was sorry he hadn't been able to finish her off. He was abruptly dragged to the office to await the police, as uninvolved students in the area speculated as to what had just taken place. In the office, Anne McGuire was fading quickly and her co-worker, the head of the languages department, spoke soothingly to her about her family and told her she was loved. She lost consciousness soon after, and her pulse for the final time in the ambulance one first responder would later say that the vicious stab wounds, some through and through, had been the worst ever seen in their career. Mr. McGuire, who had popped in back home around lunchtime, received a vague telephone call from the school headmaster, informing him that his wife had been injured with a knife. He imagined a cut arm or something equally minor and headed for the hospital. The tense atmosphere he encountered upon arrival threw him for a loop, and he was escorted to a bloody, futile scene of medical personnel attempting to revive his wife to no avail. And McGuire was pronounced dead at the hospital at 1.10 p.m. Hey, lovelies. It seems like a lifetime ago that we talked about the Great Gatsby in my daughter's English class, and here we are now, no school in session at all. In this trying time, Audible is a great tool and resource, not just for our states of mind, but for the entire families as well. Use this opportunity to stick headphones on the kiddos and encourage some quiet time for everyone in the house. It's also a wonderful time to get parents and grandparents set up, and they'll only thank you for it. With thousands of titles across every genre, everyone will find something to intrigue them. The leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, members receive one credit each month, along with two Audible Originals and access to daily news digests with all the latest and most trusted news. All of that plus guided meditation? Just what we need while we're trying to live through this lock-in. From self-help titles to help with anxiety and coping skills, to cookbooks to hone those skills we've been slacking on, Audible has literally something for everyone. As the Harvey Weinstein trial began, I listened to both Ronan Farrow's Catch and Kill and She Said by Jody Cantor and Megan Toohey, Great Chronicles of the Me Too Movement, and I'm now brushing up on my dusty language skills. If you've yet to join the Audible community or want to help someone else get going, visit audible.com slash warbaby or text warbaby to 500-500 to get started with a free title. That's audible.com slash warbaby or text warbaby to 500-500 and get ready to put your headphones on. Back at the school, Will Cornick was described by the officers as being smiley and chatty. He inquired as to what the officer's favorite movie was and wondered aloud if she enjoyed adrenaline-based sports as much as he did. 